I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to Creek Devil. So, David, you got a cup holder mounted on that lawnmower? I do. There we go. Right. I knew it. I knew it all along. <laughs> got a place to hold my sandwiches, too. Oh, hell yeah. You up down then. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fellas. Hold on. Welcome to the Q&A, everyone. David, what do we got this week? All right. This first one is from Shane Powers, 7566. A lady, I can't recall her name, asked recently if Bigfoots have learned to sharpen sticks yet. Well, that's a good question. I have no idea. What do you think, Forrest? I don't know. We've never had an account of that. Now, I will say this, that just recently coming out of Africa, and this is fairly recently, that they have actually seen chimpanzees doing this and killing bush babies that way. Yep, I heard about that. I would say Bigfoot-wise, they probably don't need to do that. You know, chimps like humans are smaller and, you know, they need more tools in their toolkit. Where a Bigfoot, you know, we, we know of accounts where they've been seen grabbing deer and hobbling them just by breaking their legs. So um, something that big and powerful probably doesn't need to use a stick very often as a tool. I've never seen any evidence for that either in the field. I think I've heard one report where somebody said the Sasquatch had a stick in his hand that he kind of used as as like a weapon. Well, now uh, Fred has had different accounts up in Alaska where they have had uh, picked up sticks. <clears throat> that oh, sure. That is not an uncommon thing for any primate. I've seen several primates that do that. Uh, chimpanzees will readily pick up sticks and beat each other with them. So uh, why would uh, uh, some other primate not do the same thing? I mean, we, we, we humans do it all the time. You know, that there was a funny um, show that we had on one time, a guy from Northern California who witnessed two juvenile Sasquatches. They must have been, he, he figured around five feet tall, I think it was. And if you recall, the one one kept smacking the other one in the head with a stick. <laughs> 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 and then when we were teenagers, we had, uh, you know, one threw a, a branch at us one night. So, you know, throwing them and doing things like that, sure. I, but I, I really don't think they'd need to sharpen them for any particular reason. Why, why would you think that would be? I mean, chimps sharpen sticks. I've seen... Chimps on TV use a stick to dip it into an ant mound to eat the ants and everything. They they make a tool as they need it. Well, they're do like you us. Think, do you think they'd rely on their size and their power and strength? The Sasquatch, and absolutely. They don't need to make weapons. Or no, they they don't need as they don't need tool use as much as smaller primates would. Well, now let me clarify something. Not all chimpanzees. <clears throat> uh, do that they learn from their mothers um and years ago uh they were just noticing that uh chimpanzees would take uh, small branches and strip the leaves off of them then stick them down in termite mounds to have the uh, termites grab hold and then they pull it out and they just pull it through their mouth and uh you know they get all those yummy termites that way and then do it again and the this mother uh, would do that, and then lo and behold, her uh, children did it. There is also an incident in, uh, with involving macaques where this uh, these particular group of macaques were being fed uh, sweet potatoes. And they lived along the, the ocean there. And one of these female macaques, hmm, it, it's funny here, I'm, I'm noting a trend here. It seems to be the females that come up with these ideas. Um, the, this one female macaque decided that for whatever reason, whether she was going to wash the sweet potato or what, she went over and rolled it in the salt water. And all of a sudden it was like, this is pretty yummy. 
And she kept repeating it. And before long, this whole group of the cats now, guess what they do with their sweet potatoes when they get it? They and it wasn't it just the- that group long, not long after that different groups of macaques on different islands were doing it too without yeah. connection between the other the two it's, do you think they did it for the flavor or just did it to wash what they think what they think the salt it's the salt uh, and it uh, they they like the taste of salt i mean everything needs salt and uh i mean you got buffalo herds that in the, that are spoken of in the early west that would travel miles and miles to go to a salt lick just to lick salt so i mean you can drive up the alcan and uh stop and gas up your vehicle and the moose will come over there and start licking your vehicle to get the salt off of your vehicle that you collected off the road yeah so, that's the, one of the illegal ways of deer hunting down here is to put a salt block out in the woods oh yeah and, that's a no-no most places you know, yeah and some of the people that I know come up with an ingenious way. They take a bunch of pot and soil, crush the salt block up, mix it in with it, and go dump it in the woods. They didn't have a salt block out there, but they had a salt lick. <laughs> All right, y'all ready for the next question? Ready for the next one. All right, this one is from Truth Seeker. What about the stories of Native American women being kidnapped from their villages by a Sasquatch? For what could only be breeding could this account for the different temperaments and types of sasquatch i don't think it counts for the different types no and there aren't, really aren't that many stories of that i think i only know of one yeah I only know of one my, my, my great aunt was a full blood creek indian uh, from down here and when she used to tell us these stories when we were younger watch out for the people in the woods they will grab you and take you away or kill you that was and i wish that woman was still alive so i could go talk to her now but she she passed away around the time i went in the army but we were kids then and we thought she was just telling us things to scare the hell out of us to keep us from getting into mischief you know in the woods and but i've wondered since then since my encounter what did she know that i did she didn't tell us you know well they may very well grab you and take you away but you're not coming back yep that's kind of she alluded to that but she she just she was she was real quiet soft-spoken and she expected you to understand what she meant by everything she said which wasn't a whole lot you know, mm-hmm. that's why I wish she was alive right now so I could talk to her. Well, All right, David. Naked Ape, can oh, I say ahead. something here? Just, yeah, the Naked ape, which is us, cannot interbreed with chimpanzees, gorillas, gibbons, or any other type of primate. We cannot do that. So I don't know. I kind of take a lot of those stories like that with a big grain of salt. So uh, I just wonder if there's not something um, possibly feral humans that are doing such as that. Well, you know, there's the story I'm thinking of is an old one. And it could be that, you know, when the person, maybe the woman was taken away, maybe that was their interpretation of what happened. When it was actually something else. Yeah. And then, you know, you can have these children that, um, uh, what is it? I'm trying to remember. I'm, I'm having a brain fart. Is it lycanthropy that where they, uh, they, uh, they have, uh, uh, they grow hair all over their body? Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Maybe that is their explanation for something like that happening, and it, all it is is a genetic mutation within humans. I mean, it's rare, but it happens. And I and uh, I, I probably should look up that word to make sure I've got it right, but uh, um, they call it the wolf effect. It's, uh, uh, you know, children, a child born with uh, hair all I over just... its body. I just looked it up. It's called, it's the nickname is werewolf syndrome. Yeah. It's yeah. hypertrichosis. 
Hyper truck. truck. Yes. Hyper truck. Okay. Yeah. I read about a Mexican boy that had that condition, and in his village, um, the rumor, the things that said was that his mother was uh, assaulted by a a a wolf. Oh boy. You know? Yeah, I mean, people people make up things to explain something they don't understand. So they showed a picture of this kid. He was like 13 years old, and I swear, he really did look like one of the TV movie werewolves, you know. Oh, yeah, I, I saw pictures of him. Yeah, so, I mean, I could see where they could get that, you know, how they could come up with that, but I don't put much... I, I can make it, people you know. mad with the whole dog man thing, but I, I won't, I'll abstain from it this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell, come on. We'll let it out, man. <laughs> and with that, we'll move on to the next one. Right. Okay, this one is from Donald Fuller, 5041. Hey, Will, how come you don't consider the time your buddy got grabbed in the tent as an interaction that you had? Well, it is, but I didn't see it happen. You know, I'm very, very literal about things. Either either I saw the creature, which is, you know, that's you have a direct encounter or you have an indirect one. Not all this class ABC crap that's out there, you know, the BFRO invented. You either saw one oh, or you yeah. didn't. The peripheral ones are things you hear, things that happen, all the other things that okay. happen where you didn't have a direct uh, sight line on the creatures. Because the most you experienced with that was seeing where it had been sitting there behind the tent, correct? Yeah, I we found you know when after he come flying out of the tent and all that happened, you know I wanted I wanted to see look if if there really if this really happened there has to be evidence of it. So we went to look to see if there were evidence and we did find evidence. Well, I got a question for you. Yeah. In all of your um, researching and field research, that's what I'm talking about, have there been times when you felt 100% sure that one was within, let's say, 50 meters of you and oh, watching yeah. you? In fact, in and, our, and our first film, there was there's one portion where we left the rock camera and we're walking out towards the vehicle out this road. And Adam put under, you know, in writing underneath that I was feeling very uneasy about the situation. It's because we could hear noises around us. And we knew I was explaining to everybody on the team, you know, about how deer move and when they move out of their bedding areas and then they move to their feeding areas and all that. And it was funny, just as I was explaining that process to them, we saw three deer coming from their bedding areas, heading to their feeding areas. And I knew that the creatures would be coming down, you know, following the deer, you know, figuring out where they were going to ambush to get their meal for the night. So um, I knew the creatures were there. We could hear noises. There were some, and, and it was too bad that the audio equipment didn't pick up the noises we were actually hearing because there were a couple of times there was that weird owl noise with the gurgling at, at the end. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't an owl. It was, it was something else. Um, and some other odd noises we heard. But uh, they were close that time, if as an example, and, and we were, I was nervous about it because we needed to be out of their feeding behaviors. Are you afraid of them, Will? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know what they do to people, so, and, and I've been told very graphically by people that have cut dead ones open, and I won't mention who or how. I know that. I know that, though. Yeah, I've been told these things. Um by the people that are involved in that stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I am. You know, one of, one of my, one of, one of my things now, I, I, I've gotten to where I go hunting, I go fishing, I do the things I used to do, but I, I can't relax like I used to when I would do things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. I could just stop up against a tree and fall asleep while I was hunting, you know, I can't do that anymore. I, I I'm alert and, when I get home, I am just super tired, and I guess it's adrenaline pumping or something. I don't know, but I remember times when, when I was hunting on that big hunting club that I was in, where all of a sudden all the birds, everything would go quiet, mm -hmm. and I would get this eerie feeling like somebody was looking at me, you know, 
And now when I get that feeling, I vacate the area very quickly. I just get the hell out of Dodge. You know, I don't hang around and think about it and look. And I just make tracks to, to my vehicle, you know. Yeah, yeah. But that's uh, a difference between me before my experience and after my encounter, you know. It, it definitely changes you, that's for sure. This all leads perfectly into the next question whenever you're ready, cuz. We're ready. All right. It's from Gravity Cheeseburger, and he says, I listened to a couple of other podcasts on the subject, and I've heard others say that the creatures don't mean any harm to anyone. I think that's bunk, personally, but what would you say to those people? There are some that don't, but they will also stay far away from people. You know, people aren't going to have any kind of interaction with that particular creatures, you know, with the, that mindset that they have. Um, but the ones that are showing themselves, they're doing that for a reason. So, and it's not a good reason. And I kind of believe the ones that we kind of accidentally catch watching us, I think they're just doing that. They're just actually just sitting there watching. What What are these things doing, you know? Could be. They're doing strange stuff, you know, because think about some of the things we do in the outdoors. You know, we hunt, we fish, we build fires, you know. I don't think they have the ability to build a fire, but I think they might be fascinated by fire oh, I'm because sure they, they see it in, na- in nature when lightning strikes and stuff, you know. I think they're fascinated by the fact that we can make fire, and I think this is my personal opinion and, and something I've thought a lot about. I think it probably scares them a little bit because these creatures can make the fire that comes from the sky. Well, here's I the really, thing. You know, I, I've talked to, you know, native folks that were had, you know, firefighting crews and stuff, and there are plenty of stories. Uh, they don't seem to be too afraid of forest fires. They seem to kind of take advantage of them, you know, when it comes to, you know, the other animals fleeing easy meal that's scared not watching for its own safety um, mm-hmm. one of the native crew i mentioned and this was from the klamath tribe uh one of the elders there told me that there was a, a story from a, a native firefighting crew that had one come running out of the fire with its hair smoldering and it fell down amongst them and got up and ran and, and they cast the handprints but uh it was in there so and then there was another person that's friend of mine that was a uh he was a Cal Fire captain, and he texted me him and during this fire that was going on in Northern California, and they saw one of the things sneaking up on a food drop. Oh, wow. <laughs> so they're not too afraid of forest fires. They, they seem to know how to navigate them. And well, you would expect that of a creature like that. I mean... Well, highly intelligent, yes. I mean, deer, and, and as far as I know, bears mountain lions they just run you know to beat hell to get away from it right and i've read i believe in one of your books will about uh a forest fire crew Mm -hmm. seeing one catch a deer that came running running from from the fire was that in one of your books uh you know i don't recall i i don't remember what i did yesterday so (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're asking me about things i wrote years ago so i don't know <laughs> but I, I remember reading about that and and how it, it kind of was just how it came from the fire and it waited and deer that was running from the fire and run off with it under under its arm yeah they you do know, things so. like that i mean they, they do that with hunters they're not they're not afraid of hunters uh, there was one old story in John Green's book where there were a couple of guys on horseback and they shot a deer and immediately after they shot the deer, this thing come bursting out of the tree line near the, where the deer fell, grabbed the deer, tucked it under its arm and took off with the deer. <laughs> so they're not so stupid. Grizzlies listen for gunshots up in Alaska. So they do it in Wyoming too. Yeah. But I was going to say, oh, because so, you know, they know there's that, there's an animal, there's prey, there's something to eat there. Yeah, they know that, that, that killed an animal. Okay. Go go ahead, Forrest. Um, uh, you know, when you go back to Bigfoot just sitting and watching, and I I think that 
we are probably a great source of entertainment for the majority of them. But after watching that show on chimpanzees where <clears throat> they sit and watch and size up uh, other chimpanzees as mm-hmm. victims and then size up women and children as victims. Which happens often. It yep. happens uh, way too frequently. And, yep. uh, you know, okay, <laughs> nine times out of ten, they're going to just sit there and watch. But are you going to really take the chance that you're going to be one out of ten that <laughs> might be the victim rather than just the, the watchee? Well, and and it goes back to, you know, what I was told by, you know, the, the friend I have on the, on the kill teams, and I won't elaborate on that, but uh, he said, he told me that the ones that are benign, the ones that don't prey on humans, they will stave out far away from where humans are, so they have no interaction. The ones you have to worry about are the ones that you see if they're there watching people and they're seen doing it, and I've had reports of that. I wor- I worry a lot about that because they're there for a reason, doing that for a reason. Well, that's Will, do you thing. remember the place I used to work <clears throat> where I told you about the kids on the playground? Right. And the woman comes over and says there was a monkey in the woods. Mm-hmm. And it's a cut because the edge of the wood line was like 50 yards from where the playground was. And as I talked to her, she had actually seen something moving around in the woods a few minutes earlier and she walked a little bit closer to try to figure out what it was, but it was watching the kids play on the playground. Yeah. It's not just curiosity. So yeah, I kind of, when she was telling me, I got, I got the hair stood up on the back of my neck, you know, because all the kids that I saw that were standing there, I don't think there was one that was over 12, 13 years old. Yeah. Forrest, you had something to say. There were some as young as four. So, right. All what I was going to refer to is Solomon, the, the, that rogue chimp that was killing, uh, that they finally had to kill, hunt down and kill, mm-hmm. uh, because it was killing women and children. Right. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what, uh, what you were talking about is when they start coming in and wanting to interact too much with humans that you know that there's a problem. That's not normal behavior. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. Did- Forrest, didn't he have like three or four others with him that was helping him do that? No, he was, uh, that particular chimpanzee was completely, uh, solo. Okay. Okay. What do we got next, David? All right. This one is from Lone 1500. And their question is, is it possible these beings are enlightened? How do they mean Enlightened. I in guess in, in, <laughs> I'm guessing intelligent. Well, they're of course they're highly intelligent. All primates are, but intelligent in in ways to find food, hunt food, catch food. You know, I don't think they read books or anything. You know, no, no, no. and they're not sitting. I'm enlightened. I'm picturing somebody. You know, kind of what did they call it? The lotus position. You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> humming or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I had when he that said in. that, that's what I was thinking. I, I'm picturing a Sasquatch sitting in a lotus position, chanting. You know, I'm like, no, I don't I, think so. I don't. I don't mean to make jokes about the question. It was a good question. But, it was uh, a good question. But enlightened. I think they're very strange. intelligent. I think they learn yeah. by watching. Yeah, they're highly uh, intelligent. I mean, well, I know the one I saw. When I pointed my pistol at it, I think it knew what that it was. I don't think it knew what it was I had in my hand. It knew it was a weapon. But I think it knew that it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. And that's why he he, he ran, you know. So, I mean, that's just my personal opinion. They are smarter than any other primate. Except for us. Some people that probably are on their intelligence level. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we were in the army. Of course, we know people like that. Oh yeah, I, I mean, they even look like Neanderthals, you know. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next question. We get about five minutes left. Okay, this one is from uh, Mac McKinnis, sixty eighty seven, and his question is: Do you think Bigfoot, when they go to the bathroom? do like cats and cover it up so we won't find it. 
No, but here's the interesting thing. Um, if they're near water, they'll defecate in water. And I get, I have there, I have several witnesses uh, that have seen it. You know them doing it. Uh, Bob Titmus told me. In fact, there's one of the stories that's in John Green's books, and and Titmus himself explained to me that he and one of the other guys in the area at the time were following this line of tracks, and uh, and they had to cross a small creek, and they found that the creature had defecated in the middle of the creek. Mm-hmm. Now, what that tells me is when they and we found places where they defecated a lot in an area. And they were almost using it to channel the game animals into this small valley. And that's where I did find uh, where an ambush point where they'd been ambushing animals along this game trail. But if they're putting it in water, then they're trying to keep the game animals from realizing that they are in the area. So you think they use it as a scent marker to scare the hell out of animals and make them run in a certain direction? Sometimes, yeah. Oh, okay. Because that, that, that was a very good question, because it's something I'd thought about, but I just never thought to ask, you know. Yeah, I, I, found, I, found, evidence. I found evidence where they, and a huge, I mean, there's there's no way it was anything else um, because of the sheer size of it. But we found, uh, and I can't remember what year this was, 2007, We there's a particular area that we go to and we find scat there, um, usually around the month of August when they're in that area. And uh, and it really seemed like because of we found it so much so much up in the high areas like they were ch- and the only place we didn't see it was in this small valley along this small creek and uh, and I, I was thinking about it I thought well how come they're doing it everywhere else in this area but not here and that's where I thought okay if you were gonna you know conserve your energy and ambush your prey. Um, how would you do it? So you'd be like a cat. You'd be sitting in a spot where you're hidden. You wait for the game to come by, and then you have that quick burst of energy. You get your meal. So it's a mathematical equation. You got more calories going in than you got going out. And the way I determined that was, I thought, well, if they're doing that here, then they're still. I mean, they they were pooping a lot. We'll put it that way. These guys had some pretty active bowels, um, and it wouldn't have stopped here. Well, twenty plus feet inside the trees i found all this scat where they were still crapping back in there they just it just wasn't out where you know game animals would have seen it or necessarily smelled it so they're pretty ingenious sometimes all right we got time for one more Okay, this one is from Bobo44 Dun Milking 51. And their question is um, here's a question I haven't gotten answered yet. Does a male Sasquatch have a private area like a human or a monkey? I would really like to know. What kind of a private area? Their private parts. Oh, well, I'm sure they do. Uh, Forrest, I'll let you address that one. <laughs> uh, yes, all of them look the same, except that uh, they haven't been circumcised. Which a lot mm. of human males have either. So, yeah. That's true. Yep. Well, Tracy, unless you have questions, I know you had, uh, had a bunch before. We can. Uh, no, we'll be I'm right. uh... I'm pretty satisfied with, I mean, I don't have any, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got some, I'll have some later, but I'll talk okay. to you about that. <laughs> All right, well. If you, if you want ahead. to send us your question, you can email us your question at dsjrc2022 at gmail.com. As Tom used to say, this show is about you guys. Any questions you have, it's not a stupid question. Send it in, and we'll answer it for you on the show. If you do, I will do my best to reply to you to let you know we did receive it and that we will be reading it on the show. And, David, you're also looking at the comments on YouTube, right, for questions? That's all the ones I'm doing right now. Yep. Okay, great. So, folks, if you have questions and we don't address them in the comments, we're going to address them here in the Q&A. So, having said that, folks, we're going to wrap up for this week. Join us next week. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.